Good afternoon. So good afternoon. All right, you guys are in the uh, best current operational peering track, or uh, best current operational practices track, so if you intended to be somewhere else, stay here anyway. Uh, okay. So uh, this is a slightly larger audience than I expected. This is fantastic. Um, so we're here today to talk about best current operational practices. Uh, so first, uh, what is uh, best current operational practices? Um, the intent is to have some place to have host uh, living documents. <laughs> that is the antithesis of things like nanog presentations that as soon as they're written and archived are considered effectively stale. Uh, it's to have uh, documents that are an 80-20 model, so it covers the majority of people's needs, um, particularly, uh, you know, the majority of sizes, so we ignore off the one-off cases. Certainly we can note deltas, um, they can be in documents, but they're not part of the main meat of the document. So cover the majority of people. It's intended to be community-based, bottoms up and transparent, uh, much like uh, those of you who are familiar with the Aaron policy development process, much like that. Anyone can contri contribute, so you can be uh, an author or a subject matter expert, or maybe you just want to know something. You, maybe you want uh, a BCOP developed that uh, for either yourself or the community, uh, if you think it should be written, certainly um, get up in this room and say so, or join the list and request it. And we'll try and pair subject matter experts and authors and requesters together. So a little bit of history. Uh, it's been about a year, uh, maybe a year and a half since we uh, brought up best current operational practices. Uh, started very small, a few of us sitting at a table having a discussion about how we could get uh, living documents hosted somewhere and keep them current. And this, this concept evolved into um, a presentation at uh, both Nanog and Aaron to see if there was some interest in this kind of uh, uh, forum existing. Uh, we launched uh, a list, bcp-discuss, and a website and a few tools to interact with documents. Uh, we had a lot of discussion on a development process, and that happened uh, at tracks and on list, uh, and was a little challenging to start uh, a development process in a room like this because we had roughly a, a chicken and egg process, right? Everybody wants to meet, um, and nobody wants to work really hard to develop the process. Uh, so. <laughs> The, uh, the last uh, uh, two nanogs ago, um, we had this, this track and pretty much got the, the go ahead from the room to just, just go ahead and give it a try, uh, write one, uh, find a few people, get it together and, uh, and launch it and, and get some meat. So we did that. Uh, it took a little longer than anticipated. Uh, did not host this track, the last nanog. Uh, there's some empty seats up here too, guys, if you want, you know, there's two rows, there's still some room. Um, there was a, uh, um, a, a lot of discussion about development process, uh, uh, and, and so we just moved forward. Uh, basically, I, I think what I heard from the room last time um, was, we, we trust you just move forward. If we don't like it, we'll scream. So we did. Um, the development process was developed outside of the meeting with a few individuals, then back to list, and, uh, and uh, here we are today. So um, the current status. <coughs> We have a best current operational practices development process draft. Uh, it's been written, uh, discussed on list in a lot of uh, private conversations. It's uh, what we think is a pretty good development process to move forward. Um, it does need ratification, but it exists in draft form. We have two BCOP drafts. So we actually have some meat, yay. Uh, one on IPv6 submitting and one on public peering exchange interface configs. Um, we've identified some gaps and some changes which need to be addressed. So we've got things like, uh, you know, names, where it lives. Like, so we have a BCP discuss list at bind.com and we have the website on sixconnect.org and we have, uh, you know, some things that are um, still called BCP instead of BCOP. Um, so we've identified a list of things that need to be done. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's some housekeeping. So we still have uh, uh, documents with BCP. Um, uh, we need to put this on a different domain. Uh, Richard, I think, looked up a few domains and maybe parked some 
uh, that, that we have some suggestions and we'll, we'll bring up here to discuss and hopefully we can get some agreement in the room so we can just move forward and put these someplace consistent. Uh, and we realized while writing some of the process documentation that um, bylaws are not BCPs and therefore don't really follow the same process and location and so on. Um, so we need to, to write a few things and we need a place to put a few things. So we've still got a few process issues to sort out, uh, but for the most part, I think we've got a good uh, place to start. Uh, so I wanted to start with um, the reviewing and ratification, hopefully, of uh, the CCOF uh, development process drafts. Um, and then we'll go into some of the meat. So we have a draft. Um, uh, we're uh, certainly not going to, to read every word of this, but I think we should probably go over um, some of the main points. Um, it, do, do you want to present them, summarize each one of the stuff? Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Uh, my, my colleague Richard, uh, Richard Donaldson at Six Connect as well, uh, spent um, the majority wrote the majority of this document, and, uh, and I think it's probably best that he summarizes. So, hi everybody. I'm Rich Donaldson with uh, my colleague Barron at Six Connect. And just by show of hands, first of all, who's on the list and who's who's on the actual BCOP list and has seen this document? Okay, that's kind of what I thought. <laughs> so, the, the rest of you, this is the first time you've actually seen this document, so it's going to be a little bit tedious. So, from just a procedural point of view, we can go through and read it. Or, but then but I think people want, might want to discuss the actual meat, the BCOPs that we've generated. If it's useful, I'm going to suggest, and we can do a show of hands here, that perhaps people sign up for the BCOP discuss list. We could submit this back out rather than go through it because it's about four or five pages kind of written in this format. But in summary, as you can see from up here at the very beginning, we've modeled this after, or I tried to model it after, existing uh, development processes, for instance, at ARINT or the IETF kind of stuff. So in that vein, this is written for the BCOPs. Um, again, it's sort of up to the group on what they want to do, because this is going to be less interesting than I think actually talking about the two BCOPs that were written for this session. So even by nods of heads, because this is the dry part that's not as much fun. Why don't you just get fonts? <laughs> 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 fonts, color, right? Type of, all right, so in any event, just again from a quick summary standpoint, uh, Aaron, Chris, Jason Schiller, myself, and a couple others put this document together, have gone through it a few times. You, you can see the version number it's at right now. The ultimate goal post this meeting will be to, in fact, get this kind of ratified so that everyone can see what the process will look like. The two parts that are here, basically broken up, are part one, kind of giving a philosophy behind the BCOP, which again, Aaron talked mostly about. I'll just slide down a little bit and kind of get into, right? Yeah. Open, transparent, bottoms up, and ongoing. So if those were the four bullet points to take out of the philosophical side of this, again, the idea is to take everything that has been done in NANOGS and generating any kind of the other operational practices that you see out there in the Aaron community to have an inclusive particip participation from everybody to get these documents created. So from that standpoint, that's kind of the philosophy. And then part two actually dives into the actual process. You will see that process on display with the two BCOPs that have been written for today. So again, we can fast over this, release it to everybody once you get on the list, get a chance to kind of read through this, and if there are any comments post that, we can actually call for ratification via the list. 
but that's step four. Yeah? Can you nod some heads? Okay, so I think it's going to be more interesting to dive into the actual BCOP IPv6 uh, subnetting uh, and the peering uh, BCOP that's been written for today. So if that's okay with everybody, we'll kind of fast over this stuff, release it, that way you can read it on your own, we can get comments from people, or we can discuss it afterwards. We'll be around, obviously, for the whole conference. You can come up and ask individual questions if you'd like. Yep. Does that work? Work? Great. Okay, we'll do that and kind of dive into the meat. Thank you. Thanks. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, that being said, we can jump into some of the meat. Um, so we'll start with uh, subnetting for IPv6. And uh, Chris will give you a little bit of a summary of what's going on with that. So this uh, is meant to be the best current operational practices for IPv6 subnetting, which basically means uh, IPv6 address architectures, right? How do you lay out your network? Um, how do you set up and break up your IPv6 allocation in such a way that it actually works for you ongoing? Um, let me go ahead and read the summary here. It says this BCOP aims to provide general IPv6 subnetting guidelines that can be followed by any network operator when planning and implementing an IPv6 network deployment. The primary focus is on understanding IPv6 subnets and addressing plans, creating operational clarity and, and future proofing. And so, uh, you know, a big part of this obviously comes that moving to IPv6 is a paradigm shift, especially when it comes to addressing architectures. Um, we've been counting addresses for a very long time with IPv4 and deploying IP addresses in the most efficient way possible with regards to the number of addresses that we're actually using. And the, the, the sea change that happens when you move to IPv6 is that you no longer care about individual addresses at all. They're completely irrelevant. And now networks are what matter. And we have enough addresses and enough networks that you can actually make a sane addressing plan from the very beginning that will scale and allow your network to grow and allow really easy configurations, really easy to read IP addresses, really easy to understand hierarchy within your addressing plan, um, which we just couldn't have done with IPv4, except for maybe in the very beginning if you back into the flash rate or something. Um, so we go to the next slide. Uh, the BCOP itself obviously has a lot of description and, 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 and stuff behind this. I'll go through kind of the, uh, the top points here and then we can discuss them, I think. Um, so the first one is every individual network segment requires at minimum one slash 64 prefix. Uh, anybody who's familiar with IPv6 uh, at all probably understands that um, there's a requirement in the RFC to use 64-bit um, interface IDs. And so basically Slack's built on that, everything's built on that. So really you don't want to go below a slash 64 for one single network. Um, the BCOP here is only subnet on nibble boundaries. So a nibble boundary is half of a byte, it's four bits. So what that does is it allows your addresses to look a lot nicer. It allows them to be much more human readable. It allows you to understand what comes next <laughs> much easier. So if you go from you know 2001 colon DB8 colon 100 colon colon slash whatever, if you're doing nibble boundaries, like if you're doing slash 40, for example, right, it would go to, from 100 to 200, to 300 to 400, and it makes it really easy to understand what's coming next, instead of doing something off of a nibble boundary where you might be going from you know, 100 to 180 to 240, and it just becomes a lot harder to count that way. Um, it says implement a hierarchical addressing plan to allow for aggregation. And so what we mean there is um, basically you set out your sites, individual locations, um, these could be buildings, they could be floors, they could be campuses, whatever makes sense for you on, on the base level of basically a site. And then you wanna have regions above that. And then you wanna have you know, your overall AS above that. And in some networks it may make sense to have more than three layers. Um, but the, uh, the big thing there is that um, you start with a slash 48. Basically if you need more than one network, just go to a slash 48, it's really easy. You're gonna have plenty of addresses, plenty of networks. Um, and then basically count those up in your largest site 
whatever your largest site needs for growth, say for five years, take that, round it up to a nibble boundary, and then use that for all of your sites, right? Even if you have others that are very small. Um, and then, again, at the regional level, you look at the biggest region with the most number of sites, project its growth out for five years, round that up to a nibble boundary, set that as your regional address, subnet, and, uh, and then, you know, you can go to the top level. So here's some examples that are in the VTOP. Um, this is for a, you know, multi-campus network. And so this, this one's fairly simple. You just have a few buildings in each region, or, and, uh, you know, we, we have a slash 48 to each building, and then within the region. So basically, this one's easy because you only have three sites within each region, within the largest region. And so it, uh, it bumps up to a slash 44, which is your next nibble up from the 48. And then you just go again from the nibble to that in the top. So this uh, here shows the, the last thing I was talking about with the nibble aligned boundaries. So you can see if you're using, if you have a, you know, a slash 32 and you break it into 36s, which is on a nibble boundary, you get this easy 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, so on and so forth. Um, if you break it into something else, like a slash 37, you can see it goes 800, 1,000, 1,800, you know, and uh, it's, it's much less logical, it's much less easy to just look at without doing bit math and actually figuring it out. Um, and so because we have the bits to spare, uh, there's no reason not to just use them and make it easy for yourself. Um, can we go back to the slide real quick? Yeah. No worries. Um, so then, uh, so then uh, after the uh, aggregation, right, the next thing is um, basically you're going to want to take one slash 48 from each region and reserve that for infrastructure. So you need your point to point links, you need your loopbacks, you need all that stuff. And so basically if you just take either the first or the last slash 48 out of whatever that regional prefix is and make sure that you count that in when you're assigning your size, then you can just use that and carve it up for whatever you need it for infrastructure wise. Um, within that, you probably want to take the very first slash 64, whether you call it the top or the least specific or whichever way you want to say it. Basically, if you had, you know, 2001 colon DV8 colon colon slash 32, and you took the first slash 48 of that, then you want to take the first slash 64 of that. So it'd be 2001 colon DV8 colon colon slash 64, right? Because then you can just have a really easy colon colon whatever for your um, loopback. One thing to note with doing loopback addresses, uh, a lot of folks have a common use that if you have like a numbering scheme where you have like R1, R2, R3 for your network, a lot of times people use, you know, just dot one, dot two, dot two, dot three, whatever for their loopback. You can still do that. One thing to remember in IPv6, you're doing hex. So 10 does not come after nine, A does, but it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, you could still just call it, if you have like an R9, R10, R11, you can still just say colon, colon, nine, colon, colon, 10. I mean, you're not actually being sequential, but doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, and then for point-to-point -point links, so right now it looks like the best thing to do is to allocate a full slash 64 um, out of that 48, and then but actually configure either a slash 126 or a slash 127. And the reason for that is if you allocate the entire slash 64, you end up um, with, again, very human-readable addresses. You don't have to, if, if you take a full 64 and break it up into 127s, then once you get further and further down in there, you've got a lot more hex bits in there, and the addresses start to get a lot more complicated, and it's a lot easier just to look at and say, okay, I know which router that is. Uh, if you just do a slash 64 for each link, then you can say, okay, this link, you know, it's it, it individual networks are very easy to identify on each link. Um, and the thing about the 126 and 127, there's a new IETF draft out right now for being able to use 127s. There's still a lot of gear out in the field that won't really work with 127s. I don't know kind of a rat hole, I guess, to get into, but there's some issues there um, with the any cast addressing and things. So basically, as far as that goes, test it in your lab, see which one works for you in your particular environment with the gear you have deployed today. Um, and then the last thing is um, sites, pops, and locations, and regions, et cetera, should be laid out such that within each level of the hierarchy, each subnet prefix is of equal size. And I actually already talked about that quite a bit when I was talking about the hierarchical addressing. So that not only is it hierarchical, but it can be even. And in most cases, most networks are going to be able to find a way to do that. Um, you may have a little bit less efficient um, <laughs> address usage, but again, uh, that's okay now. So I guess with that, um, are there any questions? Do you want to dig into the document or the examples any further, or is there anything I said that's completely and horribly wrong? Yeah, go ahead.
issues with prosecutorial and uh, litigation techniques. I haven't heard, I, I've heard a lot of people talking about this problem, but I haven't seen any solutions other than leave those narrow settings. Yeah, so that's why we say like, assign, like allocate within your system a flash 64, so you're basically burning that full flash 64, but actually configuring on the point-to-point -point link on the router a 126 or 127, which even mitigates that quite a bit. Even on a non-point-to-point -point link, you can have a WAN subnet yeah. flash 64 and have the same problem. Very true. On that, I would say that gets more into a security issue than an actual addressing issue. Um, I would still say, in that case, if you're doing a LAN segment, use the 64 <coughs> so you don't break stuff accidentally. So it's, it's gonna rely on being 64 bits there for host addressing. Um, but definitely, there's some, you know, some restrictions on neighbor discovery that you're probably gonna put in as far as filtering and things like that. I mean, what about um, if you're not planning on using the flash, like just allocating the flash 64 and using it? It's definitely possible. And so that what it comes back to what Aaron mentioned, the 80-20 rule. So in most cases, this is the right way to go. There are definitely instances where you can say, hey, I control this network, I know exactly what I'm doing, I'm gonna assign, you know, slash 80 or whatever it might be. Um, and, and, and that is actually even noted in the document saying that, you know, there are reasons why you may not need to use 64 bits for a host identifier, um, for instance, on your loop packs, right? Um, but in general, you wanna stick with the 64 rule unless you really know what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I just be interested in seeing a specific section that addresses that problem because it seems like a very common question and problem that people have is what do I do if um, somebody decides to flash me and vice versa. Sure, that's fair, that's good feedback. Google um, completely support just about everything that's in this document. Um, when I was back at Unionet, this was exactly the type of math and gyrations that we went through to try and get our message allocation. Um, the only thing that we didn't do back at Unionet was break things down on the middle band. And the reason why we didn't do that was because that was such a large oversizing factor that we felt uh, we would not have adequate utilization in some places in the network to be able to go back and get additional space. Sure. Um, I think that probably no longer holds true in the Aaron region based on how um, the NRPM policy 6.5.2.1 was recently changed mm -hmm. uh, with a number line policy for better a aggregation for ISPs. Um, however, this is not the case in other RLOs. So I, I'm not sure it would be good to recommend middle boundaries outside of the Aaron region uh, based on the <coughs> fact that that type of a utilization is not gonna be considered uh, efficiently utilized if that <coughs> site ever has to come back for additional network decision breakers. Mm -hmm. So that would be my only recommendation, add some text in there about how uh, utilization outside the AN region is different and how if you need to go back for additional space that nimble boundaries might be too large of an oversizing factor. In, in your uh, calculations at Verizon Business, uh, what size of network does that break at? Uh, the, the question is only related to, of course, subsequent allocations, right? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly if you're never gonna use more than a slash 32, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, so. Was it a 24? I, I, I think even a medium-sized transit provider <coughs> probably isn't gonna have more than a 32. So. Yeah, so I, 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 I think it's probably a, a great, but 20 piece. That's more of a caveat for very large networks very large networks and networks outside of the U.S. as well. Yeah, well, uh, um, <coughs> but, uh, cer certainly uh, notable. I, I imagine that the, uh, the other RIRs will probably lean towards uh, a similar utilization policy shortly anyway, right? I mean, this is about operational practice, not about meeting policy. Um, you know, ho hopefully we can actually work the other way, which is get people to change their policies to meet operational practices. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Uh, the only other thing that I think is worth pointing out is, as you've said before, it is a huge amount of space that you get when you do V6, so that gives you greater flexibility to do things like group customer space together, uh, group infrastructure space together, group internal uh, corporate network space together, which makes your firewall filters easier. That's a great point, that should be included, I think. Other Anything questions, else? comments on V6? Subnetting. So, um, normally, of course, the idea is that you'll have the document text in your hand before these uh, meetings. So, obviously, this is a, a, a mild chicken and egg problem. But uh, 
Um, I think it's probably worth you know getting this out to the list and, and should be fairly accurate. Uh, the, uh, the ad idea would be that uh, we have some work discussion between these meetings and at these meetings we uh, either ratify them or, or not. Um, so uh, uh, this is a starting point. I think it's a great one and uh, I think the document is very well written. Um, the nice thing again about the, the, the versioning, uh, just as Jason mentioned, made a few points that were good suggestions, is that they're living. So even ratifying documents uh, in any given state, as long as they're uh, deemed accurate by um, you know, subject matter experts and, and a, a large group of engineers is still current and accurate and can be ratified and move forward. And if you have a change or a suggestion or an intended to be added or something is now deprecated and needs to be changed, uh, we can bring it up on this or in a room like this uh, and get its version drafted to the next version and, and ratified. Do we, do we have like a national like a list where we watch for like if they all kind of change the meeting they get changed? Uh, I think that, that, that certainly, th so the question was, uh, do we have a last call process, right? Um, uh, it's, we don't have one written down yet, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, certainly that's, that's, that's part of uh, just going through this, we're gonna figure it out. Um, the first couples we figured that this, these wouldn't be too challenging and people would generally agree with what's written uh, in, in both of these, so it should be fairly easy to take the <coughs> risk to just uh, ratify, move forward, and, um, and debate on, on lists and so on for the next one. And we'll, uh, we'll we'll learn as we go. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. We do. All right. So next, uh, Mike is going to comment on his or summarize his uh, document is um, BCOP on peering interface <laughs> connections. My BCOP. So I'm Mike Smith. I'm actually with AdHost, but I'm also one of the operators of the Seattle Internet Exchange. And this document was written um, kind of as a response to what we see from people that connect into the exchange and the kind of traffic that we see. Um, suffice it to say that we see enough odd, what we consider to be odd or not wanted traffic that a document like this we felt would be helpful for um, our constituency um, and hopefully for others as well. Is Florian in the room? Hey, Florian. Um, so the great thing about the BCOP, uh, sorry, BCOP process, <laughs> is um, the, um, I had sent this document out and I was the only author on it, sent it out for comments and Florian um, kind of came up and said, well, what about this and what about this? And we got into a, dis a few discussions about what we consider to be acceptable behavior in particular situations. Uh, most specifically around how do you connect to Exchange? Can you connect directly? Can you go layer two to layer two network? Can you go through a transit provider, et cetera, et cetera? And so the document was expanded to accommodate those um, other uh, types of connections. Um, the one thing that this document does not lay out is actual configuration examples for any particular vendor. Um, I know on the Seattle Internet Exchange, we have, um, I mean, every single time we have uh, a provider with a problem, it's always on a new piece of gear or something that we haven't seen before. Um, it could ultimately be expanded to include configuration examples. Um, a lot of those exist on each of the individual vendors, and if you follow the guidelines of what you should turn off, which is really what this document is about, um, you can do that through your vendor's website. But if anybody wanted to contribute and say this is the configuration example for a Cisco, for a Juniper, Viata, whatever you want to use, um, those are certainly appreciated. So we started with the physical layer guidelines. Um, there we go. Uh, phone calls. Yep. And so the direct connect to the exchange, obviously, um, this is preferred. A layer three interface into the exchange. The exchange, um, in almost all cases, cases, is a layer two infrastructure. And so there are a lot of inherent dangers by connecting layer two to layer two. So if you've got a physical layer three interface into the um, exchange, that's always preferable, at least from the operator's perspective. Um, then in two, you can also have remote peering. Thanks um, to Florian for the, for, the, for the graphics, which would be something like this, where you have some kind of carrier connection in between uh, your participant and the exchange fabric. Um, in many cases, if you're talking about an exchange, you may have people that are connecting into it from hundreds of miles away. So we didn't want to exclude that and say, well, you can't do that because it's not a direct layer three connection. Sometimes you do have to carry these across 
um, a transport network that you don't control. And then uh, the third was the reseller ports, which of course is a single carrier selling to multiple um, enterprises. And we see a lot of that on the six as well. In fact, we see people selling transit over the six. Um, some of this, if, if you come from the telco world, this is all gonna be just kind of basic stuff. Um, but again, when you get a call at two o'clock in the morning and you say, okay, who's your carrier? Who owns the fiber? And they go, er, I don't know. Um, everything needs to be labeled. Everything, you have to know exactly where all of your connections are. You have to have an as-built that says, I'm going from, in our case, the 24th floor to this patch panel. This patch panel is labeled X. I'm in port A, A2. From A2, I go down to the 19th floor. From the 19th floor, I go panel to panel. From that panel, I go into port X on the Arista 7508. If you don't have that whole path and you're having a problem, it could be anywhere in that connection and there's no way to trace it aside from getting two people in a room together and starting to backtrace it all the way through. And if your exchange point connections are critical to you, that adds time that is really unnecessary in a troubleshooting process. Oh, hold on, wait a minute. Oh. So for the data link and network, um, what we, it was interesting for us. We went, um, originally the, um, the six was on a slash 24 and uh, we got our own air and assigned space and moved to a slash 23. We had a lot of providers, big and small, who in retyping in their IP addresses just went with the slash 24 because that was what they were used to. So I know it seems obvious, but do check your subnets um, because it's not always obvious depending on what exchange. And there is absolutely no guarantee that your configuration on one exchange is gonna be anything like your configuration on another exchange. Um, in a perfect, these are the only frame types that we'd want coming through. Um, if it's anything else, we don't want it. I mean, it, it really is that easy. And all broadcast and non-IP protocols must be filtered or suppressed on your device before going into the exchange. Remember that everything that you send into the exchange is on every other port on the exchange. And you really don't want that, particularly if it's any of the stuff related to um, the management of your network, any of those kind of discovery protocols, any of that. I'm jumping around a little bit, but you can see CDP, FTP. Um, and we do see things, we'll see DHCP come up, MOP, I mean, you name it. We haven't seen Apple talk in a while, but it's happened. <laughs> DECnet, yes, DECnet. Um, now, all of these IP redirects, IP directed broadcast, proxy protocols, any of this needs to be disabled. This is really just a layer two connection that you wanna do BGP over, that's all it is. And so anything else, make sure that you've got it filtered off. Um, layer two control, Traffic in a switch-to-switch -switch environment, this includes all of your spanning tree BPDUs. Um, all of that needs to be um, blocked in some way. Now, we, we do a lot of this blocking on the switch side as well, on the, on the exchange side, but we would prefer that it was taken care of already. Um, and of course, all IGP protocols, please. There are passive interfaces, please use them. Um, now, the MAC address, uh, we do MAC address ACLs on our side. So if you say that you're a single entity connecting into the switch, we're gonna filter you to one MAC. A lot of times if you have an intermediate switch, switch, that switch will present its MAC address along with the MAC address of the layer three interface. So that's something that you wanna take into account because you'll get a port security violation and ultimately shut down. And a little more. Now this one, number one, um, we had a lot of discussion about this on the six list. Um, and we went with must not, and we'll see how people feel about that, because I did a little research, and you can see lots of exchange slash 24s slash 23s in the global routing table. We're saying that you must not announce that IP space into your routing table and into your customer's tables. It's not necessary, it doesn't break anything. So please don't. There's no reason that anybody needs to get to that subnet directly. They can get through it in trace routes, et cetera. Um, so from our side, we would prefer that you did not. But we said must, but it could be should not as well. Um, the other thing that we see quite a bit about and um, we've gotten feedback from our peers is that someone will come onto the exchange and they'll have a script that goes out and scrapes every provider that's on the exchange, auto configures, 
the BGP sessions and leaves them there in an active state forever. <laughs> Please don't do that. One by one, when you get a new peer, turn it up. You can use your scripts at that point. But auto-configuring all of this so that it sits in an active state means that it's pumping out traffic, looking for those peers on a regular basis. And if you've got 200 peers on an exchange, that's a lot of unwanted traffic. Um, oh yeah, number five. The uh, Please do, uh, every exchange has um, an address where they send out information. And then I know this seems um, kind of obvious, but a lot of the times your key people won't be on that list. And so when things happen, you won't know why because the appropriate people aren't subscribed. So please do subscribe the appropriate people to whatever lists are available for the exchanges that you're on. And finally, um, in this section, please do turn down sessions and actually delete them. Um, same thing, somebody goes away, you know, we send out, what we do is we change the DNS that says departed, please remove. And when I'm going through our TCP dumps every night, we have at least half of our peers have at least 10 active sessions that say, this person's no longer here, departed, please remove. Um, so please remove. And finally, the other guidelines is kind of generic, well, stuff that didn't fit anywhere else. There are a couple different security mechanisms, not very many. Um, we're not gonna go into kind of the newer stuff that Randy's working on. Um, MD5, some people have it. I mean, obviously it's just a should, you can. Um, we don't advise it one way or the other. Um, MAC address control list, we really don't advise. We just put it in there because I know that some people do it. Um, we have found personally having exchanged to exchange connections with MAC address controls that it's very hard to keep those updated and if somebody changes a router at three o'clock in the morning, all your sessions go down and you can't get them up until somebody goes through the process of updating that MAC table. Um, IP ACLs, you know what those are. Probably a good idea to use them. Um, GTSM was just recommended today. It's not something that I've put into play, so it was, it's the uh, TTL hack. Um, but again, should enable if you can, and if it's obviously providers on both sides are supporting it. Um, number two, peering DB is a, is a big one. Does everybody know, does anybody not know what the peering DB is? Okay, so please do have a peering DB updated, um, uh, what would you call that, form input. Um, it's important, that's kind of the easy place where everybody goes to find information. I know on the six page, that's what we link to. Um, so that if somebody's looking for information on your network, how to get in touch with you, what IP space you should or should not be announcing, um, that's where you go. And of course, with the routing registry, everybody knows what that is. Um, we say must have up-to-date objects, um, hopefully ones that you added and weren't added for you in 1994. Uh, it is what it is. And so the conclusion really um, was kind of just a change to the, um, just be liberal in what you, or be conservative in what you send and conservative in what you receive. Um, unfortunately, because of the layer two nature of exchanges, um, being loose on that and being, um, I is not a good idea um, for everybody's benefit because all of these different protocols that are not just a BGP peering session have the opportunity to take you down and everybody else down on the exchange simultaneously. And so it's really about being a good participant in a public area. Thank you. Questions? Scott, Li Scott Librand. Um, regarding the must not announce into the global table. Um, would that not break uh, down downstream customers that are using loose URPF break their trace routes? We had some back and forth on this and I don't know the answer to that. I think it would. I've seen the space announced. Does it break it? I've seen the space announced successfully and not cause problems. I can see a you shouldn't announce it to your transit providers, you shouldn't announce it to your peers. But downstream but is fine. But put it in your table at all, that seems a little excessive to me. And that's kind of where we started and we went back and forth. I took some, um, obviously there's been input from a lot of the six people on this and we have a couple of people who are really intensely committed to no um, routes. However, I do, I think that's a good change. This might be too administrative for this, I'm not sure, but one of the 
my pet peeves is people that send out emails to everybody that's in an IX. So I'm not peering with them, but they send me, we're doing maintenance, or we're going here, or we're go I don't care. So could we put something <laughs> in this that says there's etiquette to who you do and don't send those notices to? Because you really shouldn't be sending that to people that you're not actually peering with. We have a, I know on the six, well, we have two different mechanisms. We've got a broadcast mechanism where we can send things out that's not a reply to list. And that's really the one that I was kind of referring to for the subscriptions. We also have a members list, which is, that's the one that you want to subscribe your NOx to because that's the one where everybody says, we're doing maintenance at X or X. Yeah, I don't know. I think some of them are actually even just pulling the whole list and making their own personal, which, so that means we have to actually say, hey, dummies, don't do that. Sorry, I don't call anybody <laughs> a dummy, but um, we just kind of need to, to do some like training on etiquette for email because I get enough email already. So it Does everybody think that's okay to add as a, okay. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. <laughs> Louis V. Equinix, um, I see where Marla is coming from on that. Um, so yes, uh, develop your own internal mailing list to announce to your peers on a per site basis. Thank you very much for this. Uh, it's very helpful, and I'd be willing to contribute more to this. Uh, another up, uh, an update I'd like to offer is that uh, not only let your NOC know about the mailing list, but actually uh, train them on how to deal with issues on an IX, because they're used to dealing with one BGP session per link per customer. So a BGP session going down, emailing the IX doesn't help. Oh, thank you. And I'd be willing to support uh, ratifying this today if that's the issue. Anyone else? Pizza. <coughs> okay. Um, thank you for this document, it's a really appreciate, appreciated document. Um, about um, BGP security mechanisms, I mean, I'm curious why you decided to not specifically recommend MD5, and also, um, do you think that there should be a mention of TTL in uh, BGP security? Well, the GTSM is, is in there as it should. Um, the MD5, um, that's kind of really between two providers as to, we, we put it in as a, as a may. Right. Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of it just because of the processor overhead for what I consider to be very little benefit. Mm. Um, but that's a personal preference, so we, that's why we kind of put it in as a may. And in fact, any security mechanism that you're gonna put on a connection is a may as far as the exchange is concerned. Because whether or not your device is actually secure doesn't necessarily affect the exchange itself, necessarily. Right. But I, I mean, I would consider it a best practice um, because if you don't have MD5, then anyone else who's on the exchange could spoof your BGP uh, clearing program. So it seems like it's a best practice. <coughs> whether if people want to ignore the best practice, that's up to them. Yeah. Scott Libran, response to that. Um, I have seen dozens of sessions down due to mismatched MD5. I have heard of zero sessions down due to exploiting that theoretical bug. If anyone else has heard of those, I'd like to hear about them, but so far, MD5 has been completely a break things for no reason feature. Yeah, it, if you're in the, if, if you ever have to swap out gear, um, those MD5 keys are the first thing that you have problems with, almost invariably. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's what we have for um, drafts for today. Um, again, since so many of these, the people in this room are not currently on the list, although I see people subscribing to it while I'm sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we should probably have a, a, a short window of time as a sort of anomalous um, ratification process for <coughs> at least these two, uh, maybe 
give everybody a couple of weeks to read through texts and respond. But um, but do keep in mind that, ag again, if there are changes that need to be made, you can certainly suggest um, changing those. Uh, I would certainly like to see the development process itself just get ratified and move forward. And if you don't like it, you know, you're a community. You can figure out how to change it. Uh, you just have to get enough people to steer in the same direction. Uh, so I, I guess I should ask, do, does anybody have any um, serious objections to us moving uh, the, uh, at least the draft process forward as written today, even having not reviewed it in great detail? Lovely. Then we, we will just simply ratify that one, uh, and, and you can then read the ratification process uh, uh, in detail when we email it out to the rest of them. Um, so we still have some housekeeping stuff, but I figured we'd keep it um, much more interesting for the room first and start with um, proposed drafts. So this can be, uh, you want to see something written, you're a subject matter expert, you're volunteering to do something, um, submit ideas for BTOP. Uh, what would you like to see written? This is for the room. Um, anybody interested? I mean, you can certainly do this on the list as well, but uh, you know, anything that you want to discuss in terms of a best current operational practices draft document subject, uh, the microphone's yours. And one thing I like, that, that piece is, uh, you know, looking at scope as well, right? So we want to keep most of these uh, BTOPs fairly well scoped. And so some of the things that were even already brought up, like I heard from, you know, BGP hearing best planning practices, perhaps, and maybe um, just technical mailing lists, best planning operational practices, perhaps, were two potential ideas already thrown out today. Anybody? Sorry? Yeah, um, and, and this is certainly one of the housekeeping <laughs> topics as well. well. We'll go through, I think, with a couple of the main parts on this of discussion and, uh, and disagree in the room and, and change it. Um, but certainly feel, feel free, open mic. About the um, potential BCOP uh, subjects, I would recommend something like how to use communities uh, on your internal BGP network to help Bill Nock identifying false leads or something like that. And I'm willing to contribute. Awesome. Hi, I'm Ron Bonica. I'm from the IETF, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> awesome. Is this like a 12-step program? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I totally understand why this wants to be distinct from any IETF working group because A, your documents are living, they're changing, they're not looking to be RFCs anytime soon. Right. Uh, also because you want input from the operator community only uh, with uh, stars around the word only. We might want some level of integration between the two because there, there really are some things that the IETF can do to help you. For instance, I can offer you a mailing list with archives. Um, if you'd like to meet at the IETF, you can or not, um, depending on your needs at any given time. Um, if ever you'd like to progress anything from this mailing list to an ops area BCP, we can help with that too. Um, I'm not sure if you'd want to this is something for this group to think about. If you want to maintain your documents as internet drafts, we can have somebody refresh them so they never die. There are some good things about that and some bad things about it. The good things is some issues that you haven't thought about yet get thought about for you, like IPR issues and copyright issues. The bad things is, the bad parts are, you may not like the IETF, IPR, or copyright policies, yeah. you're certainly not going to be thrilled about doing everything and asking. Yeah. So in any event, it's an offer. Take it. Leave it. No pressure either way. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I, I think we've, we've had um, several people from the IETF uh, suggest that there were some um, potential uh, synergies, and, and we could work together 
Um, we're all offering to help you. Yeah, <laughs> r right. Um, I mean, I, it's a community-driven thing. Um, uh, I, so great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Other topics? Richard Donaldson again, and actually commenting on what I'm hearing from the room, of all things, which is in the documents that we submitted today, the DPOP, I heard a lot of sort of this 80-20 concept where almost like a for dummies book, maybe there's some call outs specifically in the draft. So if we want to incorporate that in future versions, would that be helpful for everybody? Because there have been some individual comments per these two DPOPs, and so would it be useful in light of that to incorporate that into the documentation itself. And again, I'm posing that to the group versus what you've seen today is a very kind of clean, structured, you know, here's a thing, a living document that can do that, but there have been some individual queries that might want to be incorporated. And then last one, Dr. Kelly. <laughs> okay, well, I'll throw that. Well, the question is, in the documentation that you saw today, again, this is the first draft, and so it's, it's, it's intended for everyone here to participate in, but, but there were some individual specific questions, whether it was in the hearing document or even the IPP6 subvetting document, that may not be useful to the 80%, if you will, rule, but they are useful to highlight for those 20% anomalies. And so is it useful to incorporate that into the DPOP draft and ultimately ratified document, almost like you have in a, if you've ever read a For Dummies book, they have those call outs to kind of give you, here's something to think about sort of on a discrete basis. It's not a general rule of thumb, but it's useful to know that there are these kind of anomalous situations that require that type of structure. And so if that's useful in this document that Richard's kind of addressing, maybe we can kind of incorporate that into the draft process. That's a fabulous comment. That's exactly why I posed you the question, because it was out there, but I think that's a great suggestion. So, okay, it's just something to think about. Jason Schiller, Google, and Richard, specifically on your point, I, I, I think that's a great idea. I think that. Um, there's kind of two cases for this. I think the first case is if you can identify the edge cases that fall out of the 80% that the, this is good advice for, you can say, look, if you can identify yourself as within this 20%, this actually turns out to be bad advice for you and don't follow this. I think that's very important to highlight right in this document. I think if there's another document where we can capture some of these 20% cases, that would be great. If there isn't another document, I think that we should at least make reference to it, that there, you know, in the 20% space, there are some other things to consider, and they are A, B, and C, one paragraph at most, maybe just as a call out. Um, put it in a separate section that people can clearly skip if they're not in the 20% case. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll also put the, the generic template that we put together up on the slide so you can see that. Yeah, certainly a, a caveat <laughs> section of some flavor would be uh, a very useful thing. Yeah, what I found Sorry, um, what I found uh, while writing the, the IPv6 one was m it kind of made sense to do it in line. And so what I did was I, I tried to italicize text. And so, for instance, with the slash 64 uh, subnet saying there's a note there that just says note and it's in italic. And, you know, we can work on formatting issues and how to actually include this, right? But just calling that out, I think that is definitely important to do. Um, to say, hey, hold on a second. This, you know, it may not apply. Especially if, if, especially if it's nearing where it may be less than the 80%, right? Like you're, you're now you're at like 60% territory. It's still the best thing to do, but. I was going to change the topic, so if you have anything else, a chance to speak on top. Okay, well, back to the idea of looking for ideas. Uh, I think we touched on another good one, and that would be knock operations. We could outline things, the autorespond rules, knock SLA, breachability. Uh, if anything, you know, stop those knock on knock mail bombs. That'd be great. <laughs> but, you know, that's the sort of thing that we all run into eventually. You open up your email, you've got 200 autorespond. So 
that's an idea. Would, would you be willing to draft something? I would be willing to contribute. I don't know that I would be the best owner. I might find a knock manager for that, but okay. I can troll around through some of those or, too. Or, or make an introduction to the, the list or, or, or an individual. Yeah, to no, I can, I can dig around and try to find somebody that would be a good owner. And so one thing we didn't cover with, with the uh, draft process as we kind of breezed over it, um, we did talk about it in Atlanta a little bit, was you know, there's kind of two pieces to these documents. Um, one is the, the subject matter experts that are actually doing the bulk of the, of the writing and the editing and, and watching. And then there's also the role of shepherd. And so most of these documents will have a shepherd, or all of them should end up with a shepherd that can help find the SMEs and pull it together and, and make sure that the, the document makes it through. And so shear them when it's time. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and Greg Dendy with that corner. Thanks, Greg. Louis Lee, Equinix. Um, uh, so we're working on documents that would help you guys run your own networks well. Um, is it in scope to have documents to help your own customers run a little better? For instance, maybe something, a basic guy just uh, configure BGP, uh, somebody that's uh, coming up on multi-homing. Anything like that, you know, um, because everybody Eventually, their boss asks them to write their own BGP guide for their own customers. Uh, of course, you'll have your own reference for whatever communities you support, how to adjust for those. But just basic BGP, uh, instead of pointing them at a book, a huge book, and they're trying to get running within t two weeks. I think that's a really good point, even just a little bit broader, is that, you know, this isn't just for service providers, right? It's for network operators, which could be, you know, a really small office. It could be bigger. And some things, like, there's going to be some DCLPs that only apply to certain spikes. Like, there's something like, like the carrier, you know, in internet exchange stuff probably applies only to large data centers and large ISPs. But there's other ones that could be specific for smaller companies. And there could be ones that are just generic across the board. Hi, Aaron Smith uh, from Our Science College. I'm one of the uh, types of customers that could use one of these documents. Um, so I'll put that forward to Alex, somebody who could use some of these more basic relative to the larger network um, back end documentation and experience. Thank you. I don't think we have that long. <laughs> I'll be honest, uh, for I, I am the networking staff uh, for a small liberal arts college. So any kind of resource, and that's really why, I, this is my first time using it. Uh, so Welcome. thank you. Um, it's been great so far, I'm loving it. Uh, but any kind of assistance that I can find, any kind of a resource to sort of fill in the gaps between what a vendor says and what an academic book written 10 years ago is saying about how to provide these services. Yes. That no, even as something as simple as if I'm gonna roll my own on DHCP, what should I be doing? What's the current best practices for something like that? Let alone more abstract, you know, larger in connections to other ISPs like using BGP or you know, OSPF within my own network, things like that, so thank you. Thank you. Um, since those are independent geeks. Um, the uh, one thing that I've been doing is I've been working with a number of ISPs, and one thing that we've been, uh, this is back my days when I was at the EFF. I'm not sure if it's going to be applicable for this, but we're, I've been collecting templates of best practices for dealing with law enforcement. So I'm not sure if that would be something you'd be interested in in dumping into this pile, but will. Yes. So this is like. Generic. Really? Okay. So this is like how to deal with subpoenas and, for instance, not accepting faxes and things like that and all that sort of stuff. So um, I have those. I can just start throwing those in right now, actually. That would be so fantastic. Okay. Thanks, Jen. Marla? So I am wondering how conflict is going to be um, dealt with because there are some issues with D6. We all, we all know we have... Uh, Multi-homing is a requirement of some networks, and then we have Aaron policies, people pushing for only permitting a slash 32 from a provider to only allow that one, you know, announcement, which flat out screws up, you know, multi-homing. And I know everybody has a solution of 
well, go get PI for them. I'm telling you not every network customer is going to want to do that. So there's going to be issues, and so then you're going to have the operators that are like, screw it, I'm letting, you know, if it's this subnet size, I'm letting it through. So how is that going to be de-conflicted? Because we actually really do need to start working on that, and I'm, I'm planning on two different areas of a network right now, and I, I have requirements that Aaron policy doesn't meet, but as a provider, we need to do it. So how are we going to, I don't know if I should go to Aaron right now and propose yet another, this is what I find asinine. I yeah. feel like I need to go to Aaron and propose a policy to unscrew things, and I shouldn't have to do that. The, the so part of the original conversation and the reason for this existing I, right. is because there's a significant gap between policy and operational practice. So you don't mind me bringing it back to the original reason why we no. all gathered at that dinner. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't want to let that go, and I can't let it go because now it's actually kicking me in the face yeah. as I'm trying to plan what subnet size I'm going to do. And oh, by the way, this subnet has to be completely segregated from this subnet because we have mail issues, or th there are certain factors that you have to acknowledge, but there's kind of been this blindsided thing going on with Aaron policy, and when it comes to the end of the day, I got to make it work. So how are we going to deal with that? So just to, for the clarity of the room that do not participate in uh, our registrar processes or Aaron processes, um, the real core of the issue is not enough operators attend Aaron meetings. Uh, so what you get is policies get passed without understanding operational impact. Can I address that? Yeah, go ahead. So, <laughs> Jason Schiller, Google. So the reason why I got involved in this initially is because there were a number of policies going through Aaron, and I would jump up and say, let's look at what the operational impact of such a policy are. What does this do to routing? What does this do to multi-handling? What does this do to our routing table size? And, and various operational concerns. And the people in the room said, Aaron does not set routing policy. Aaron is not concerned with routing policy. And John Curran would always ask the question, you know, we can change the scope of the Aaron community. Do we want to be concerned about the implications it, for operators in the routing space? And the answer from the community continues to be no. So where do we talk about routing policy? If you don't do it in Aaron, and there's not a forum to do it at Nanog, and the IETF isn't the right place, what is the right place? And, and that's where this community has really come from. So. So does that mean you're gonna do the operational, the routing policy BCOP, BCOP? <laughs> some text. I'm, I'm not sure that I can actually offer the whole thing, but I would love to take a shot. The other th is like a, a BCOP for operational impact of Aaron policies, is that? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, if you go through the NRPM and actually say, or the, in, and say this policy affects this in this particular way, is that something that you could then take back to Aaron and say, now we have operational input on whether or not they're writing this, the policies for that particular purpose, this is what the community sees as the operational impact to what you guys are doing. I think it would be good if we had this community put that together, which Jason and I both are invested in it, and we both have, you know, this much time, but if we could have, you know, agreement in this group setting that, yes, this is something we need to do, and I'd be willing to even try and, you know, usher it through with Aaron stuff, but standing up, that like, him at one point, me at another, it's kind of like one person in a big crowd, and it just doesn't, it hasn't gone anywhere. So we need the support of a collective group. And yeah, I, I've, I've actually gone through NRPM already, and I've pulled out things where I, I can point them, I already have them written down. There, it, it totally screws several factors for, for routing. And yeah, they, they aren't concerned about routing, um, but the policies affect them. <laughs> so, so I wanted to actually address Marla's direct question, which was, what do we do about contentious issues like v6 multi-handling? And I think the answer is a little bit complicated. I, I think to the extent that this community can agree that there's one best common practice, 
then we should absolutely document that. And if we can do that, then we should take it to the Aaron community and try and drive policy that supports what operators have done. In the event that we can't find agreement, because we've got people standing on both sides of the spectrum arguing their heart out, saying that it should be X or Y, and those are both mutually exclusive, then I think the only thing that we can, doc we can do is document those two stances and do a kind of pros and cons approach. And at least that way, when other people enter into this sort of a discussion, or when other people are faced with trying to make the decision of should they configure their network to be behave more like X or Y side of the spectrum, that they at least know what the arguments are and what the trade-offs are and what the pros and cons are. Don, is, is, there, a, is there a feedback mechanism for Aaron for this kind of stuff? That's what I'm about to say. Okay. <laughs> Scott Librand, um, Aaron Advisory Council member, among other things. Um, there is at least a third of the Aaron Advisory Council in this room. Um, <laughs> we are very interested we are very interested in suggestions for how to improve Aaron policy, whether they're made in the Aaron meeting on PPML, by you guys talking here, out of a BCP, by pigeonholing me in the hallway. I don't care, but we need input. And we get some input. We don't get enough from operators. Um, it doesn't really matter whether we are making changes to Aaron policy because of routing impact or not. If it's something that the community wants to do, it should be suggested and the community will discuss it. And I don't know if you read PPML, but people are not afraid to discuss whether it has routing impact or not. <laughs> so it, let's do the BCP, BCOP thing um, for anything that's applicable there. Whenever there's interactions with um, Aaron policy, somebody say something and we'll make sure that, that um, we have the opportunity to get that into the process and then we can highlight on the BCOP list when there's discussions on PPML that are relevant. I mean, we can do that sort of coordination and we just need the input. So please say something. Thank you, Scott. And, and, and thank you all of AP. <laughs> Full BD. Okay. Um, can anybody else at the mic? One thing I wanted to add to this, sorry, I haven't written one now. Yeah. Um, a definition, uh, section of Aaron. Definition. Uh, so we had some other housekeeping related stuff, a little less neat, but um, uh, you know, one of the points that was brought up was that we probably need some flavor of organizational bylaws written uh, and I guess I should open up to the room to see, does anybody have any particular suggestions for how it should be structured, uh, or should we just take a stab at it and uh, send something off to the lake? Yeah, well, you know, something, right? Anybody have any really strong opinions one way or the other? A half a page of spaghetti? Noted. <laughs> Okay, um, the, the other one that was left on my list was, uh, was the main, um, I, as I mentioned, you know, there's a list on blind.com, we have a website on fixconnect.org, we have uh, mixed up. We'd like to rename it, um, something more generic that is uh, related to best current operational practices. Um, of course, I forgot what we were suggesting there. Uh, okay, so the one that we have uh, uh, currently held is ipbcop.org. Um, does, does anybody have any strong objections to renaming it to more focused on BCOP? That is excellent. So um, while the uh, contact information uh, does say um, bind.com and so on, uh, if you subscribe to it, uh, and I hope you do, um, uh, don't, don't worry, I will, I will make sure a list gets properly moved and uh, Everybody that joins gets copied and they update it on URLs, et cetera. Uh, but we'll definitely <laughs> like to um, make it more appropriate. Cool beans. Uh, so that's all we have on the uh, agenda. Um, uh, and if you'd like to bring up any other topics, feel free to hop up to the microphone and. Or be the first to do anything. Yes, I'm. 
awesome. Um, please, everybody, do uh, do join the list, and uh, really appreciate everybody the community's contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.